G'day ladies and gents and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program with Mags and welcome aboard the Muna 2. This is a variation on the Muna 1 rocket that I used in the last mission in order to do a orbit of the Mun. However, this time I'm not going to the Mun and the rocket has had a couple of modifications. We're going to Minmus. Now, my plan for this mission was to both get low and high altitude Minmus science and to attempt to land on the planet. Unfortunately, because I've run a series of mods that increase difficulty level, not unfortunately, I do this deliberately because I like the challenge, I had to make a few modifications to the rocket. The first of which was I had to sacrifice the guidance fins that stabilise the rocket after the SRBs are released. So for this particular launch I need to leave the SRBs attached until I break around about 30,000 metres, as I'm basically using the SRBs as guidance fins to prevent the rocket from tumbling while it's at relatively low altitude. Now as we've passed 30,000 meters, I can now release the SRBs. Unfortunately, this did lower the efficiency of the launch. Now the reason why I had to sacrifice the guidance fins, on the previous mission to the MUN, there was a couple of things I noticed. Now the first thing you need to understand is I run USI Life Support. This is a life support modification that limits the amount of time a Kerbal can stay in space. There is a food supply that needs to be kept up to them, but also a power supply that must run the life support systems. And two things happened on that MUN mission. When I re-entered Kerbin after completing the mission, I only had one day of life support left on board, and I was almost completely out of power. Now, if the power runs out, your Kerbal will survive for a very short period of time, and then it'll die. If the food runs out, same deal. There's a per period of inactivity that the Kerbal, uh, the Kerbal will not respond to commands, and then it will die. The mission to Minmus is going to take longer than the mission to the Mun, as Minmus is further away. I needed to find spots to fit a, my newly researched solar panel, a battery backup for extra power, an extra life support pod in order to extend the life support out to 14 days, which is just long enough to be able to make it to Minmus and back, and because I was going to try for a Minmus landing in this mission, an extra goo canister in order to be able to bring the goo science back from the surface of Minmus if I actually managed to get there. Now the catch for that the guidance fins had to go as I have a 30 part limitation and I was already on 30 parts so I had to sacrifice 4 parts from somewhere. Now keeping those SRBs on like I did unfortunately lowered the efficiency of the initial launch so I'm not as high or as fast as I would have liked to have been or I was in the previous mission which is going to put a demand on fuel and because I have a 30 part limitation I can't expand the fuel tanks on the ship in order to make this initial burn easier. I actually really enjoy this early stage of the game with mods because you do have limitations on exactly what you're capable of doing. You cannot just brute force everything through. You must balance on this 30 part limitation. Now the biggest thing here is it means I'm going to have to burn more fuel in order to get to orbit and the burn to leave Kerbin and go to Minmus is substantially longer than the burn to go to the Mun. The upside of the whole thing is that once you have achieved an encounter with Minmus, Minmus' gravity is so low that you can actually break Minmus orbit using just the jetpack that your Kerbal has. So more fuel to get there, but less fuel to be able to return. Now, the question remains, and I didn't know because I don't prototype these early missions. I just run them. I do the best design I can possibly put together based on the parts that I have and the requirements for the mission, and then I just do them and see what results. I'm hoping at this point that I'll have enough fuel to be able to perform the Minmus landing even after the longer burns and the heavier usage of my fuel load in order to be able to get to Minmus in the first place. However, if that's not possible, I should still definitely have enough to be able to do both a high and low encounter, picking up all of the Minmus science and coming back for return. Now the reason why I'm doing this mission is... Well, as much as I enjoy playing with the 30 part limitation, I do want to build the bigger ships. And to build bigger ships, I need to upgrade the Kerbal Space Center Vehicle Assembly Building. And for that, I need about 360,000 credits. The mission to Minmus, I'm hoping, will be just enough for me to be able to get the amount of money that I need to upgrade that and to be able to run a single mission following. So, having achieved orbit, the first thing I'm doing is making a slight adjustment burn. Unlike the Mun, Minmus is not on an equatorial orbit around Kerbin. It's on a slight angle. So, I'm adjusting my orbit. Very, very low powered burn. Doesn't take a lot of fuel. So, it matches that angle. So, any burn that I do from that point should always cross over with Minmus's orbit. And for those who are going to point out the, uh, the moon that we have doesn't actually have an equatorial orbit, no it doesn't, it's because the Earth is on a slight inclination in its rotation. 
Kerbin isn't. Kerbin is on zero inclination, and so is the Mun. It's a perfectly round orbit, which is why it's so easy to get to without a lot of the systems available. In fact, it is possible, if you know what you're doing, to be able to get to the Mun on your very first launch without unlocking any parts, just using SRBs, although it is substantially more difficult to get back, and which is why I didn't do it, because life support limitations. And speaking of the differences between Kerbin and Earth, having two moons actually results in some rather interesting problems as well. You'll notice at the start before the intro rolled, I had to wait a couple of days before I ran this launch, with the rocket just sitting on the pad. The reason for this was the moon, or the mun rather, was actually in a position where any attempt to try and get an encounter with Minmus was going to result in the, uh, the Mun actually capturing and having its own encounter, which is going to throw the orbit off and throw the rocket out into the middle of nowhere. So I needed to wait a couple of days for the Mun to rotate around its orbit just far enough that I could successfully make a maneuver to Minmus and back without the Mun getting in the way. So with the burn adjusting our inclination completed, now it's time for us to sit back and see if we can work out how to get an encounter. Unfortunately, we're not in a ideal position to be able to grab one at the moment. Generally, you want to be at a slightly higher orbit to get a really smooth encounter with Minmus. However, I've minimized everything possible, including my orbital altitude, in order to conserve fuel for this burn. It's still entirely possible to get the encounter, of course, which you'll see here, but I'm going to be moving at a higher speed than I would like, and it's not going to be as clean an encounter as I would prefer. So I'm just using the maneuver nodes to extend out to the orbit for Minmus, and I reckon around about here, and we can see we have a very, very, very small encounter. The two blue markers indicate the location of the planet and the location of my rocket at their closest approach point. And what I want to do is get those two needles as close together as possible. Now, if I can get those two indicators to actually touch one another, I'll be able to see the encounter and the capture from Minmus straight away. The problem that I'm having here is because I'm launching from such a low orbit, or burning from a lower orbit rather, my velocity is actually going to be higher than escape velocity for Minimus at the point of the encounter, so I'm going to have to do a burn once I get there simply to be able to be captured in the first place. And this is simply an unfortunate of the circumstances and the design for this particular mission. It is possible to get a really smooth encounter at this point, but I would need to be starting from a higher orbit. And to be starting from a higher orbit, I would need more fuel during the initial escape burn from Kerbin itself and the burn to put myself into orbit which means I would need more fuel in the earlier stages in order to be able to complete that burn, which would require the sacrifice of more parts. And the only parts that I've got left are the very science experiments that I'm trying to get to Minmus in the first place. So with our maneuver node planned out and we're now on target, it's time to begin the burn to shoot us out to Minmus. And I've actually just realized at this point that my lighting mod for the uh, rocket lighting, for the exhaust lighting, is not actually working. So I'm going to have to replace that one and find out what the current mod is for the current build of KSP. Which is unfortunate, it's quite pretty seeing the rocket exhaust actually light up the underside of the rocket while it's flying through the dark side. It's really quite good. So now just fine-tuning the last parts of this burn. Most of it's actually completed. And there we go, we have our encounter. We can see the yellow, it's small, it's not a very big encounter, it's only going to last a short period of time, but that is all I need. From there, it's just a matter of working out, once I get close, how much delta V I'm going to need to be able to circularize an orbit around Minmus, land, take off, and leave, and if that's possible. And if not, just changing the orbit enough that I can get a low and a high altitude encounter and then shoot back off into space. And so we have our encounter. Now, as you can see, it's almost a perfectly straight line with very, very little movement based on the gravity of Minmus. So we're going to have to burn to slow this down. The best way to do it is right at the point of crossing. So according to the maneuver planner, it's going to take around about 175 to 180 meters per second worth of delta V in order to be able to create and circularize an orbit around Minmus. Now, I certainly have that much left in the tank, but the question becomes then, 
am I going to have enough to be able to do the landing as well? Because there's no point in creating the orbit if I still don't have the fuel to be able to create the landing. I can just do a flyby here and return back to Kerbin and that will save me significantly more fuel. And this is precisely why I run the mod Kerbal Engineer. Doing the calculations for Delta V can actually be a bit of a nightmare, although I do know how to do them, but I don't take any particular joy in it. Kerbal Engineer does those for me. It tells me how much I've got left into the tank on this particular rocket based on all of the variables. And from there I can use that number to work out whether or not something's a possibility. And at the moment, it's not looking good. I have 623 meters per second left in the tanks. It's a 9.9 .9 second burn. It's going to take 180 meters per second to circularize. You're looking at probably another 150 in order to descend, another 150 in order to get back into orbit, and then from there you're probably looking at 100 to break with the remainder of the fuel to be used in order to adjust to get a good encounter with Kerbin's atmosphere to begin error breaking maneuvers. If I was perfectly 100% efficient with every single burn that I took, theoretically it's possible. The problem is that there is absolutely zero margin for error if I'm going to try and perform a landing. So as I said, I packed an extra goo canister on the off chance that we were going to be able to do the landing, but if we can't, I was happy to do a low and high flyby and get out. So that's what I'm doing now, adjusting the maneuver nodes to set myself up in a path where I will come down on the moon, I will be able to pick up the high science, I'll cut through and get the low altitude science around Minmus as well, so I need to be fairly close to the surface, and then the ship will continue all on its own, back out into space, and break out of the sphere of influence, returning to Kerbin. And I've actually got the perfect burn. 218 meters per second in order to complete the burn. It's going to bring me around 43 kilometers away from the surface at this point. And with some very fine adjustments, I'm going to be able to get that within 11 kilometers. The rocket is then going to continue on and leave the sphere of influence of Minmus all on its own and actually return for almost a atmospheric encounter with Kerbin. Now this is going to leave me with about 400 meters per second of delta V inside of the tank, which is more than enough to make fine adjustments on approach to Kerbin to make sure I hit the upper atmosphere for error breaking. And as an added bonus, it leaves enough fuel in the tank for a last minute burn to decelerate very rapidly as I'm beginning to enter the atmosphere of Kerbin itself. So this is my best option. And unfortunately, I messed it up. Well, at least not by a huge margin, but still bad enough. I overshot the burn point by seven minutes. Uh, thankfully, it's not going to make too much of a difference. It just means I'm going to have to burn a little bit more fuel for Kerbin adjustments on the other side of leaving Minmus. But it's still within margin. So this is why I like to have a bit of a margin for error. If I had made that mistake and I was going for a actual landing, that would have been the end of the mission right there. So once again we slide towards Minmus under time acceleration and this time we're on the light side so we start getting a good look at the planet itself and we're going to get close enough to get a really good glimpse of the surface. Looking like a giant uneven bowl of mint ice cream, there's actually very few relatively flat areas on the open soil of Minmus. Not that the gravity really causes you much of a problem with landing, but still the most popular landing spots for your first touchdowns tend to be the ice lakes that are floating all around Minmus. They're its major defining feature, and they're also extremely flat, making for perfect landing sites. Now, Minmus is probably going to feature pretty heavily in this campaign. The last time I did a campaign like this, I wound up turning Minmus into a refueling station. The low gravity meant that it was very easy to get large orange tanks loaded up with mined fuel from Minmus into orbit. So what I would tend to do is bring my inter interplanetary ships out to Minmus first, refuel them after they've been assembled and burnt away from Kerbin, and from that point I actually drop them from Minmus into a close orbit of Kerbin to start a slingshot in order to get them on their way to wherever their intended destination is. And that of course brings us to the main reason why we came to low altitude Minmus in the first place, for the science experiments. In total, leaving Minmus, I'm going to have the goo canister report, a pressure reading, a temperature reading, as well as both a crew report from inside of the cabin and an EVA report for both high and low altitude Minmus. This should punch me well over 400 science with what I've already got from the MUN mission back at Kerbal Space Center. Overall, not a bad haul, but now I need to make sure I've got enough money in the end to actually use any of it.
So with Minmus slipping away into the distance and a couple of small control burns in order to set up our encounter for Kerbin, we begin the final descent into the planet itself. Now I've already set this orbit to impact the upper atmosphere. I did make a slight pause here however. I do have one goo canister left and I decided to try and pick up some additional science on that goo canister from high altitude Kerbin. I've already done this science once before but every little bit helps and see if I can bring that back as well. And I also needed to destroy the last goo canister on the outside of the tank. I'm doing this to make sure I don't get any aerodynamic instabilities once I start aero braking and the external fuel tank or the final fuel tank is blown off so I'm just down to the command pod itself. Basically the extra battery that's been running the life support and the SAS systems as well as the solar panel that feeds them both are both on the fuel tank. Once I jettison those, the SAS system that will be keeping the pod stable during re-entry will only be running on internal power and I know I'm going to need at least one pass through the atmosphere and then a partial orbit before I can actually re-enter. If it's more than that, uh, I need to take multiple aero braking passes. The combination of the power draw of the SAS system plus the power draw of the life support system is probably going to kill the battery. Now that's not a problem for the life support side of things, providing I'm continually hitting the atmosphere of Kerbin, the Kerbal will survive long enough to get into the atmosphere, so that'll be perfectly fine. Jebediah will be able to survive that, but the catch is that if the pod becomes unstable at the speeds that I'm going to be moving at during these aero braking passes, and turns over and goes nose first, it could destroy the parachute or just outrightly destroy the command pod. If either of these things happen, this mission is over. So still under time acceleration, we're down under 100 kilometers, and now we shut down the time acceleration and make sure we are all aligned ready for our retro burn. This will be where I clear the last of the fuel in the fuel tanks. It's not going to take long, there's less than 4 seconds left in the tank, and with the burn complete, at this point I'm not going to immediately release the tank. The fuel tank and the engine are not particularly aerodynamic, and the best part about them is they're also entirely expendable. So I'm going to ride into the first part of the aero braking with the fuel tank still attached. At some point during it I will release the tank and let it drift off away from the command pod. But for the moment I'm going to be basically using it as a heat shield and air brakes to make the first aero braking maneuver a little bit more efficient. And we're just passing below 61 kilometers into 60 so we're now officially entering the upper atmosphere. And there it is, re-entry commences. Now, the only thing that I can do at this point is release the tank. It's the very last action that's in my lineup and from that point I'm as much of a passenger in this particular mission as you are. There is pretty much nothing I can do. Just watch and see what happens. Now at the moment we've got a nice long bright flare, but you'll notice it's rather quiet in the background. That is because we are still up in the upper atmosphere. We're still up above 50 kilometers at this point. So we are getting the shockwave, we are generating heat, but the air isn't thick enough here to really pull the ship down. You can however see if you look in the top left hand corner the apoapsis of this particular orbit dropping rapidly and this is what the aero braking is all about. The idea is to slowly use the atmosphere to slow down the command pod so it doesn't hit the lower atmosphere at 2000 meters per second and simply disintegrate and the idea is to do it without actually expending any energy of your own. Cheap, efficient and beautiful. And at this point, the fuel tank and engine have done its job, so it's time to send them on their way. They will actually increase in altitude and start crawling their way back out of the atmosphere before finally making the plunge and disintegrating. So far, I'm actually pretty proud of that with my space program. At this point, I haven't left any debris, which is unusual. Normally, by this point, I've got SRBs floating in space and all sorts of clutter that you've got to worry about as you're trying to establish an orbit. But this time, nothing. And so the fires of re-entry begin to fade away as we slowly climb our way back out of the atmosphere. At this point it hasn't been too bad a start. Between the initial final burn from the engine plus our first aero braking maneuver we've managed to bring our apoapsis height down to just under 1300 kilometers and still dropping. And as we finally manage to crawl our way completely out of the atmosphere, we're going to be at about 1,250 kilometers at our highest point. This is still higher than I would like, but it's still in a good position. And for those wondering about the planetary effects mods, this is Eve, Planet Shine, 
and Scatterer all combined together with the appropriate files which are available on the EVE website that make EVE Scatterer and Planet Shine work together efficiently to get the effect you see here. And so as we head up to our apoapsis and past it, we begin to see exactly where our next uh, point of entry for our error breaking is going to be. And it looks like we're going to be hitting right on the Terminator or the point between the light and dark sides of the planet. So we should be considering Kerbin's rotation, error breaking and perhaps even landing into the early morning sunrise. And once more into the atmosphere we go, the thermal shock wave beginning to form around the heat shield and the sun rising in the distance. It's actually quite a beautiful sight with all these mods on. And once again, there is pretty much absolutely nothing I can do at this point. I'm just along for the ride. The pod is staying stable. I still have enough power to run the SAS system, although battery power is getting awfully low inside the command pod. Now I have been shutting down the SAS system once I've been clearing the atmosphere and even turning it off so it's not drawing any power while it's completing the orbit. The problem is that the life support system constantly draws power so there is a constant power loss on the pod at all times. And this is actually a problem because as you can see that error break wasn't enough. We got down to about 50 kilometers and more importantly we managed to drop our apoapsis down to about 264 kilometers so this time we're definitely going in. But on this rotation, I ran out of power as I was beginning the approach to the atmosphere. As the upper atmosphere began to buffet the pod, as you can see, it developed an instability. Um, this is because I didn't actually destroy everything on the outside of the pod. The small thermal uh, sensor on the right-hand side is still there, and it is just enough to induce a small oscillation in the pod. Unfortunately, at this point, there's absolutely nothing I can do about that. I'm just along for the ride. With no power, I can't even correct or activate the SAS system to try and stabilize it. Thankfully, however, the oscillation wasn't that bad, and once the pod got into the thicker part of the atmosphere and the re-entry effects fully started firing up, the pod seemed to self-stabilize. But this was what I was concerned about. If something had gone wrong there, and the pod had just tipped over and gone nose first in, the parachute would have been destroyed almost instantly, and if the pod had managed to survive, it still would have impacted the surface of the planet at somewhere around 200 meters per second, with nothing I could do about it. So, with that little bit of worry out of the way, we can just enjoy the very last entry into the atmosphere. At this point, we're burning in towards the sunrise, we're going to have a nice show of clouds, just judging from what's ahead of us when we arrive. It's all very pretty and beautiful. The thermal effects are starting to ease off, so we have managed to survive without the heat shield failing either, which is beautiful. And that's really it. From this point, it's just a matter of letting enough altitude fall away for deploying a parachute. So, this is my first mission to Minmus. Was it overly complex? Yeah, it probably was, but that's in part because of the limitations of the mods. However, should this actually have managed to earn me enough money to upgrade the VAB, the vehicle assembly building rather, I will have enough to be able to expand these rockets. I don't think I would use the maximum parts. The next step up from 30 is actually 255. I don't think I'll need anything anywhere near that big but I will be able to easily set up a rocket that will be multi-purpose and be able to perform landings on both Minmus and the Mun at will. Which means at this point, it is time for me to start thinking about expanding my space program. At the moment, I still only have the four original Kerbal mods. So, this is the point where I start making a few more. And by making, I'm looking at my Patreon supporters. Anyways, ladies and gents, thank you very much for watching, and remember to click that like button, subscribe if you want to see more and you haven't already, and until next time, I'll catch you in the skies.